In this video, I will be presenting one reason why I will remain Catholic and never become Eastern Orthodox. Now, both Catholics and Eastern Orthodox have valid sacraments and apostolic succession, but I believe that the Catholic Church alone possesses the fullness of truth. The Eastern Orthodox, while very similar in faith to us Catholics, doctrinally reject papal infallibility and the filioque, and therefore they do not possess the fullness of truth that us Catholics have. In this video, I will be arguing that Catholicism alone possesses the fullness of truth and will show that the Eastern Orthodox Church's position on the filioque is erroneous. One should only be an adherent for religion because he or she believes that religion is true. I believe that Catholicism alone possesses the fullness of truth. Therefore, I can never and will never become Eastern Orthodox, even amidst the challenges we face in the Church. Before we get into the argument, Let's cover some background information that I discussed in my previous videos. The Eastern Orthodox condemned the filioque and asserted that the Son can have absolutely no role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit in their authoritative Council of Blacarnay in 1285. Remember the Eastern Orthodox at the Council of Blacarnay in Thomas against Bekos Canon 4 asserts, quote, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him. For this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source, exactly as it has the Father. Not to say that it has its cause and source more so from the Son than from the Father, for it is said that that from which existence is derived likewise is believed to enrich the source and to be the cause of being. To those who believe and say such things, we pronounce the above resolution and judgment, we cut them off from the membership of the Orthodox, and we banish them from the flock of the Church of God. End quote. So affirming the Son plays any role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit is a condemned view for the Eastern Orthodox, and they admit that if the Son plays any role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit, it implies the Son is cause and source of the Holy Spirit, exactly as the Father is. Furthermore, they go as far as to cut off those who make such assertions, from the Church of God. Now in Thomas against Beckos, Canon 5, we see the following, quote, For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's, from which the existence and essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. End quote. So the Eastern Orthodox cannot affirm that the Holy Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Son in any manner, and they cannot say that proceeding from the Father and the Son is a hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit. Neither can they say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son hypostatically. The argument I will be making is that the Western Church universally taught the filioque for centuries, and I will be using the Athanasian Creed as the main support for this argument. This means that the Eastern Orthodox position on the filioque is untenable, as they will have to admit that the entire Latin Church defected from the true faith and held a heretical position for centuries, while they still remain in communion with these people holding heretical views. This is a completely untenable position and destroys the indefectibility of the Church. The Catholic position on the filioque can assert that the Latin Church did not reject the true faith, but adhered to Orthodox Trinitarian theology from the beginning. So the Catholic view maintains the indefectibility of the Church. So one should not maintain the Eastern Orthodox position on the filioque, and therefore should embrace Catholicism as a fullness of truth. This is one reason why I could never become Eastern Orthodox. Now let's move on to the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed was a very popular creed that expounded the Orthodox faith concerning the Most Holy Trinity and the Incarnation. Although modern scholars do not believe it is composed by St. Athanasius, for centuries there was universal belief that St. Athanasius was its author. Even saints venerated both East and West thought the Athanasian Creed was composed by St. Athanasius, even councils thought that the Athanasian Creed was composed by St. Athanasius. The argument that the Western Church universally believed in the filioque does not depend on St. Athanasius being its author, because regardless of its authorship, the Athanasian Creed definitively taught the filioque, and the Western Church universally received this teaching and upheld it as orthodoxy. According to Dr. Ed Sachensky, on page 68 of The Filioque, History of a Doctrinal Controversy, scholars suggest that the Athanasian Creed was composed in the 5th or 6th century. 
This means this was an early document that was composed and shared pre-schism. This point is important because here we shall show that the Filioque was taught by the Western Church for centuries prior to the schism. Now let's go to the substance of the creed. At the beginning of the Athanasian Creed, we see the following is said, quote, Whosoever will be saved, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith unless every one do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence. End quote. So at the beginning of the Athanasian Creed, we have an explicit assertion that the following beliefs are needed to be saved, and that this is the Catholic faith. Furthermore, the following verses will be focusing on the Holy Trinity, and specifically, the distinction of persons and their unity in essence, as we see the Creed asserts, quote, And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence. End quote. So the context of this section of the Creed is about the hypostatic essential level of the Most Holy Trinity, because it's pertaining to the distinction of persons and their unity in essence. The context is not about the energetic level or the economic level, but rather about the hypostatic essential level. If we jump to verses 19 to 24 of the Athanasian Creed, we see the following is said, because just as we are obliged by Christian truth to acknowledge each person separately, both God and Lord, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to speak of three gods or lords, the Father is from none, not made nor created nor begotten, the Son is from the Father alone, not made nor created but begotten, the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, not made nor created nor begotten but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits, end quote. Notice once again that the context is about the distinction of persons and their unity in essence. As verse 19 says, we must, quote, acknowledge each person separately, both God and Lord. So we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to speak of three gods or lords, end quote. And that's verse 19 to 20. So once again, this is about the hypostatic reality of the persons and their unity in essence. So this is all about the hypostatic essential level, not about energies, not about economy. Now what follows line 19 and 20 is an explanation of the distinction of persons and their unity in essence. In line 21, we see, quote, The Father is from none, not made, nor created, nor begotten, end quote. The Father is from none, or ingenerate. That's talking about his hypostatic property and lack of a hypostatic origin. He is not made. That is referring to his personal origin, not about energies, nor about economy. The Father is not created, is referring to his personal origin, or lack thereof. And he is not begotten, is also about hypostatic origin, since begetting is a hypostatic procession, not an energetic or economic procession. Note that none of this is referring to economic procession or energetic procession or eternal manifestation. All the attributes enumerated are regarding hypostatic origin. So clearly, the immediate context is once again about the hypostatic origin of the persons. The next verse states, quote, The Son is from the Father alone, not made nor created but begotten, end quote. The Son being from the Father alone is referring to the Son's hypostatic origin from the Father. When we say he is not made nor created, we are excluding those options from his hypostatic origin. When the creed says he is begotten, it is asserting that it is his hypostatic property. So once again, all the attributes enumerated are indicating hypostatic origin, not energetic procession or eternal manifestation. So how do we read the next line then? Quote, the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, not made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Clearly, it is following the same exact pattern. Not being made nor created is about hypostatic origin. Not being begotten is about hypostatic origin, as begotten is a hypostatic property, referring to a divine procession, not an energetic procession nor an economic procession. So proceeding from the Father and the Son is about hypostatic origin. 
So clearly, the Athanasian Creed is saying that the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from the Father and the Son, something that is anathema according to Eastern Orthodox theology. Remember, the Council of Blackernay authoritatively asserts the Son can have no role in the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit. So clearly, this directly contradicts the Eastern Orthodox position as defined at the Council of Blackernay, showing there is literally no way to synthesize this view with the Eastern Orthodox position. Remember, the Eastern Orthodox at the Council of Blackernay in Thomas against Bekos, Canon 4 asserts, quote, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through Him and from Him, for this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source, exactly as it has the Father. To those who believe and say such things, we pronounce the above resolution and judgment. We cut them off from the membership of the Orthodox, and we banish them from the flock of the Church of God. End quote. And also, in the Thomas against Bekos Canon 5, we see the following, quote, For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's, from which the existence and the essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. End quote. But clearly here in the Athanasian Creed, it asserts the Holy Spirit's hypostatic origin is from the Father and the Son, and the Council of Blackernay condemns this and states, quote, This would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source, exactly as it has the Father, end quote. In other words, the Eastern Orthodox are conceding the Florentine teaching of the Filioque, logically follows from admitting the Spirit subsists or receives its being from the Son or through the Son. In other words, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son as one principle, or the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son is exactly in the same manner as the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father, meaning the Son is a cause of the Holy Spirit. The only distinction is in the mode or manner of holding the spirit of power. The Father has this of himself, whereas the Son has communicated the spirit of power from the Father. Objection! In the legendary filioque debate between scholastic answers, Christian Wagner, and Ubi Petrus, we hear Ubi attempt to explain the Athanasian Creed by saying it is about eternal manifestation. The only problem with this objection is that we clearly show that this is not about economic procession, nor energetic procession, nor eternal manifestation. We clearly show that the immediate context was about the hypostatic properties of the persons, and the context as indicated in verse 19 is about the distinction of persons and their unity in essence. Energies do not account for the distinction of persons and their unity in essence. The divine processions and their hypostatic properties do that. And after listing the hypostatic properties of the persons, verse 24 says, So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. So clearly if the verse that follows the listing of the hypostatic properties of the persons says that this is why there is one Father, one Son, and one Holy Spirit, this is clearly about their hypostatic properties and the distinctions of the persons, not about energetic procession nor eternal manifestation. This is literally the most ad hoc and absurd reading of the text and has literally no basis. It is a poor way to avert the obvious meaning of the text, and anyone who analyzes the context of this part of the Athanasian Creed can clearly see how weak and absurd this objection is. Anyone who provides such an interpretation should not be trusted for interpreting texts. Now why is this devastating for the Eastern Orthodox position? Well, the Athanasian Creed, including the section on the Filioque, was universally received by the Western Church. According to Waterland, in his book, A Critical History of the Athanasian Creed, Scholar's Choice Edition, page 180, he states, The Athanasian Creed's, quote, Reception has been both general and ancient. It hath been received by Greeks and Latins all over Europe. As to the antiquity of its reception into the sacred offices, this creed has been received in several countries, France, Germany, England, Italy, and Rome, end quote. And J. N. D. Kelly, in his book, The Athanasian Creed, on pages 41 and 43, asserts the Athanasian Creed was used, quote, to serve as a catechetical instruction and test of orthodoxy, for in this case, the clergy, end quote. And we know that it was used liturgically, as it was included in the divine office and in the Psalters, and was sung every Sunday at Prime. And furthermore, we know that saints venerated both East and West, considered it orthodoxy, and recited it, including the section on the Filioque. So we see that the Western Church universally upheld the Athanasian Creed and therefore universally taught the Filioque, which is something the Eastern Orthodox cannot maintain. 
So now we shall go through some evidence that the Athanasian Creed was universally received in the Western Church and show that saints venerated by Catholics and Eastern Orthodox recited the Creed, even including the portion of the Filioque. Let's begin with St. Caesarius of Arles. St. Caesarius of Arles is a saint both in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Church. He was a bishop and church father and lived from around 468 to 542 AD. He was a very popular preacher and in Sermon 3, in Caesarius of Arles' Sermon, Volume 1, translated by Mary Magdalene Muller, page 27, Caesarius of Arles recites the Athanasian Creed in his sermon. In the sermon, he asserts, quote, The Holy Spirit was not made or created or begotten, but proceeds from the Father and the Son, end quote. And on page 28 of the book, St. Caesarius of Arles includes a portion of the Athanasian Creed, which asserts, quote, This is a Catholic faith. Unless one faithfully and firmly believes it, he cannot be saved, end quote. So here we have a saint, both East and West, reciting the Filioque in the Athanasian Creed and using it for catechesis in a sermon. In fact, in that very sermon, he prefaced it with, quote, And because it is necessary and incumbent on them that all clergymen and laymen too should be familiar with the Catholic faith, we have first of all written out in this collection the Catholic faith itself, as the Holy Fathers defined it, for we ought both ourselves frequently to read it and to instruct others in it. This can be found in J.N.D. Kelly's book, The Athanasian Creed, page 76. So we see that according to St. Caesarius of Arles, this is the faith of the Holy Fathers, and it should be familiarized with all clergymen and laymen. Can the Eastern Orthodox make this assertion? No. They believe that the Filioque is a God-denying heresy. St. Caesarius of Arles says that this is the faith of the Fathers. Furthermore, this shows that the Athanasian Creed was already in use by 542 AD, probably even before then, showing that the Creed is an ancient creed and that the Western Church believed in the Filioque for centuries prior to the schism. And this is found in Catholic University of America Press, St. Caesarius of Arles Sermons, Volume 1. Now let's move on to St. Venantius Fortunatus. St. Venantius Fortunatus is a saint both East and West, and he's considered a church father. He lived from 530 to approximately 609 AD and was Bishop of Poitiers. According to Wikipedia, he was one of the most prominent poets at this point. St. Venantius Fortunatus wrote commentaries on the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and on the Athanasian Creed. His commentary on the Athanasian Creed was around the year 571. This shows he viewed the Athanasian Creed as authoritative and up there alongside the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. St. Venantius even uses expressions from the Creed as seen in his authentic works. This shows that the Athanasian Creed was viewed as orthodoxy by St. Venantius and that it was an early creed. In his commentary on the Creed, he asserts, quote, Not therefore confounding the persons, for there are three persons altogether, for it is begetting, begotten, and proceeding. The Father is begetting, who begat the Son. The Son is begotten, whom the Father begat. The Holy Spirit is proceeding, because it proceeds from the Father and the Son. End quote. Clearly, he agrees with the Athanasian Creed and asserts that the Holy Spirit's hypostatic property is that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Note that the Father begetting and the Son being begotten is about the hypostatic properties, so the Holy Spirit proceeding from both is about his hypostatic property, not about economy, not about energies. Here we have a church father and saint both East and West affirming something that is considered a God-denying heresy that will banish you from the Church of God, according to to the Eastern Orthodox Authoritative Council of Blackney. And here we have the Latin text. From Waterland's book, A Critical History of the Athanasian Creed, page 299. The Fourth Council of Toledo in 663 was presided over by St. Isidore of Seville, and the council produced a creed that contains the filioque, using parts of the Athanasian Creed. St. Isidore of Seville is a saint both East and West, and a bishop, confessor, and doctor of the Church. He is considered, quote, the last scholar of the ancient world, end quote, Wikipedia. And he was the originator of most of the enactments of the council. The Fourth Council of Toledo's Proceedings is prefaced with the following, quote, Since we are holding a general council, the first utterance of our voice ought to be about God, so that after a confession of faith, the ensuing business may be established as it were on a most firm foundation, end quote. From J.N.D. Kelly's book, The Athanasian Creed, page 39. The Creed from the Fourth Council of Toledo includes the following, quote, Proclaiming the unity in the Godhead, we neither confuse the persons nor divide the substance. We declare the Father to be made by none nor begotten. The Son we affirm to be not made by the Father but begotten, 
the Holy Spirit we profess to be neither created nor begotten, but proceeding from the Father and the Son, end quote. And the creed in this council also includes the following, quote, This is the faith of the Catholic Church, this confession we preserve and hold fast, which whosoever shall most firmly keep shall have everlasting salvation, end quote. Here we see a council affirming the filioque, pulling from the Athanasian Creed, and we see that St. Isidore, a saint both East and West, sees that this is a Catholic faith. Furthermore, we see this belief professed in what is now considered Spain. The Second Synod of Auten in 670 AD was held by St. Leodegar, Bishop of Auden, a saint both East and West, who lived from 615 to 679 AD. At the Second Synod of Auten, they referred to the Athanasian Creed as the faith of St. Athanasius, and they asserted, quote, If any priest or deacon or cleric cannot recite without mistake the Creed, which inspired by the Holy Spirit, the apostles handed down, and the faith of the Holy Primate Athanasius, he should be episcopally censured. So here we have a saint venerated both east and west, presiding over a local council, forcing clerics to learn the Athanasian Creed, showing the filioque was a necessary belief, and that the Creed was being held to a high esteem, next to the Apostles' Creed. From J. D. Kelly's book, The Athanasian Creed, page 3 and page 41, from Catholic Encyclopedia on Auten, and from Wikipedia on St. Leodegar. Additionally, we see that the bishop-elect used the Athanasian Creed to prove the loyalty to the Catholic faith, prior to holy ordination, showing the filioque is an orthodox position. Furthermore, an ordinance attributed to Charlemagne, which decreed, there are the things all churchmen are ordered to learn. First, the Catholic faith of St. Athanasius. The other items included the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Order of the Mass, etc. End quote. So here we see that clerics are forced to know the Athanasian Creed and that it's used as a test of orthodoxy for the ordination of a bishop, clearly showing that the Athanasian Creed was received by the West, and that the filioque is the teaching of the Latin Church. From J.N.T. Kelly's book, The Athanasian Creed, page 42. Now let's move on. In 809, we have Theodolphus, Bishop of Orleans, write a treatise on the Holy Ghost, and he proves a procession from the Father and the Son, using the Athanasian Creed. In that same year, the Latin monks of Mount Olivet wrote a defense of the filioque, appealing to the Athanasian Creed. From Waterland's book, A Critical History of the Athanasian Creed, Scholar's Choice, edition, pages 35 to 36. Following along, in 820, Haddo and Aito, Bishop of Basel in France, made a book of constitutions, quote, for the regulation of the clergy of his diocese, end quote. Their fourth rule was, quote, that they should have the faith of Athanasius by heart and recite it at the prime, that is, at seven o'clock in the morning, every Lord's Day, end quote. Once again, we see that the Athanasian Creed is being used for catechesis for the clergy, and that is being introduced into liturgical prayer, showing the orthodoxy of the filioque. Furthermore, we see that it was believed to be written by St. Athanasius, from Waterland's book, page 37. Around 852 AD, St. Hinkmar, venerated in the Western Church Benedictine Order calendar, Archbishop of Reims, quote, directs his presbyters to learn Athanasius' treaties of faith, beginning with whosoever will be saved, to commit it to memory, to understand its meaning, and to be able to give it in common words, that is, I suppose, in the vulgar tongue, end quote. Once again, the Athanasian Creed is being used for catechetical formation for the clergy, showing the filioque was accepted as orthodoxy. From Waterland's book, pages 37 to 38, St. Ansgar was a monk and then became an archbishop of Hamburg-Bremen in Germany. He's a saint both in the Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox Church, and he's considered the apostle of the North. Quote, Among his dying instructions to the clergy, he left this for one, that they should be careful to recite the Catholic faith composed by Athanasius, this is reported by Rembertus, the writer of his life and successor to him in the same see, who had been likewise monk of Corbe, so that we have here two considerable testimonies in one, end quote, from Waterland's book, page 39. Here we have another saint venerated both east and west, telling the clergy to memorize the Athanasian Creed, showing the filioque's orthodoxy. This occurred in Germany, showing the creed was accepted there as well. Around 871, Alderbertus, successor of Bishop Prick of St. Hinkmar, asserts the Athanasian Creed has been, quote, received with great veneration by the Catholic Church, or being of customary and venerable use in it, end quote, from Waterland's book, page 40. St. Abel of Fleury was a monk and abbot of Fleury. He's a saint both in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Church. In a letter around 997, he writes, quote, I thought proper in the first place to speak concerning the faith, which I have heard variously sung in alternate choirs, 
both in France and in the Church of England. For some, I think, say in the Athanasian form, the Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made or created but proceeding, who, while they leave out nor begotten, are persuaded that they are the more conformable to Gregory's synodical epistle, wherein it's written that the Holy Ghost is neither unbegotten nor begotten but proceeding, end quote. Notice that St. Abel Fleury is saying that the Athanasian Creed is being liturgically sung in France and in England, with the part saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. He corrects them, because they leave out the part of the Creed where we say, nor begotten, applied to the Holy Ghost. Notice that he does not correct them for the filioque formula, showing that he believes that it's orthodox, and that he affirms it as well, and that this is the faith of the Church in France and England. So St. Abel Fleury has no problem with the filioque being liturgically sung. He's just correcting them for leaving out the part about the Holy Spirit not being begotten. This is something the Eastern Orthodox cannot affirm. From Waterland's book, pages 41 to 42, and from Wikipedia, Abel Fleury. Now here's a table of some of the ancient testimonies referring to the Athanasian Creed. This is from Waterland's book on page 56. We see that we have reference to the Athanasian Creed all over Europe throughout the centuries. Objection! The Greek version of the Athanasian Creed does not include the Filioque, therefore the Filioque is a later interpretation to the Athanasian Creed. The Orthodox who take this view will say that verse 23 should say, quote, The Holy Ghost is of the Father, not made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. End quote. So they will leave out the and the Son clause. Reply to Objection there are six problems with appealing to the Greek Athanasian Creed, which lacks the filioque. Problem number one. The Creed is originally a Latin document, not a Greek one. So appealing to the Greek document is appealing to something based on the original, not to the original itself. We should appeal to the original document. Problem number two. All the earliest manuscripts of the Athanasian Creed unanimously have the filioque included. Showing this objection is completely going against all the evidence. It's not based on historical evidence at all. It's completely ad hoc. Remember, we showed that St. Caesarius of Arles in the 500s has it. Remember, we showed that the 4th Council of Toledo in the 600s goes off the creed and has it. All the Latin usages have it. Note that the introduction of the Athanasian Creed to the Greek didn't come into centuries later. From J. D. Kelly's book, The Athanasian Creed, page 86. Problem number three. The context of the previous sentence indicates the filioque was always there. Verses 22 to 23 in the Athanasian Creed reads as follows. Quote, the Son is from the Father alone, not made nor created but begotten, and the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, not made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. End quote. The Son proceeding from the Father alone is contrasted with the Holy Spirit's procession, clearly indicating the filioque was always there. The reason why the previous line says the Son proceeds from the Father alone is because the next line we have the Holy Spirit proceeding from both. So the previous line is contrasted with the following line indicating their hypostatic distinction. So from the structure of the verses, we know that the filioque was originally there. And if the Holy Spirit was to proceed from the Father alone, why would they say the Holy Ghost is of the Father and not proceeds from the Father alone, just like the previous line? This is because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, filioque. Problem number four. Furthermore, John Beckus, patriarch of Constantinople, originally a Greek anti-unionist who ends up studying the Father's and supporting the filioque at Second Leones, quotes verse 23 of the Athanasian Creed in defense of the filioque, indicating the Greek manuscripts of the Athanasian Creed had the filioque early on. So we have evidence against the Greek manuscripts backing the filioque. From J. D. Kelly's book, page 45. Problem number five, the evidence points to the fact that the Greeks removed the filioque clause from the Athanasian Creed due to their bias. In fact, quote, an incident has come to light, however, which proves that a Greek version of the creed as a whole was in existence well before 1252. In that year, two Cistercian, Latin monks from Constantinople, visiting the Emperor John III at Nicaea on the business of their order, surprised a copyist in the Greek convent at Hyacinthus, their work writing out the quinquonque in Greek. To their horror and indignation, they noticed that this version of verse 23, he had omitted the filioque, but they were soon relieved, indeed overjoyed, to discover notwithstandingly his omission. The embarrassing words and the son stood in the original he was copying. What is immediately important for our purpose is that the original is described in the account several times over as oldest book, oldest copy, ancient book. 
These adjectives must imply considerable age, and as there seems no reason to doubt the truth of this story, we are entitled to infer that the Greek text of the complete creed has been available in the East, at any rate, from the latter years of the 12th century. From J. D. Kelly's book, pages 46 to 47. So we see that we have evidence that the filioque was removed from the Greek version. Problem number six. Clearly we show that the filioque is not a latter interpretation. Even if it was, which clearly all the evidence points otherwise, you would still have to deal with the fact that the Latin church universally recited the filioque part of the Athanasian Creed and sung it in the divine office weekly and that it was used for catechesis for clergy and laity and that was put up there with the Lord's Prayer and the, and the Apostles' Creed and that it was used to test one's orthodoxy. In other words, you will still have to say that the entire Latin church defected from the true faith and that you were in communion with heretics for centuries and that many saints that you venerate all claimed heresy as orthodoxy, which is absurd. But this is the logical conclusion of the Eastern Orthodox position as expounded by the dogmatically binding Council of Blackernay. In fact, the unsubstantiated appeal to the filioque being a latter interpretation reminds me of what Cardo Bessarion said regarding the Greeks accusing the Latins of forgery at the Council of Florence. Cardo Bessarion states, quote, They brought forward passages not only of the Western teachers, but quite as many of the Eastern, to which we had no reply whatsoever to make except that they were corrupt and corrupted by the Latins. They brought forward our own Epiphanius, as in many places, clearly declaring that the Spirit is from the Father and the Son, Corrupt, we said they were. They adduced the words of the saints of the West. The whole of our answer was corrupt and nothing more. We found ourselves deprived of a just cause in every direction, so we kept silent. End quote. From Father Gill's the Council of Florence, page 224. So we see that the Greeks at the Council of Florence are just saying that everything is a forgery. Likewise, we have Orthodox making the same argument right now. The filioque in the Athanasian Creed is just an interpolation. Forgery, forgery, forgery. Interestingly enough, one would assume that given how bad that this argument claiming that the filioque was a latter interpretation into the Athanasian Creed is, it would be a fringe position in the Eastern Orthodox Church. However, we have reason to believe otherwise. Let's talk about the 1642 Eastern Orthodox Synod of Jassy. This synod took a confession from Peter Moglia, edited it, and then published it as an authoritative catechism. In 1643, all four Orthodox patriarchs of what was left of the Pentarchy, according to them, then signed onto the document from the said 1642 synod. The authoritative catechism of Peter Moglia, Patriarch of Kiev, has reference to the Athanasian Creed and says that it was written by St. Athanasius. In fact, it's used to disprove the filioque. <laughs> you heard me right. They quote the Athanasian Creed, say it's by St. Athanasius, and use it to disprove the filioque. In their authoritative catechism, they state the following, quote, The Holy Ghost proceedeth from the Father only. The same doctrine St. Athanasius lays down in his creed, Quote, the Holy Ghost is of the Father, not made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. End quote. Yes, you heard me correctly. An authoritative Eastern Orthodox Council produced an authoritative catechism that attempted to use a corrupt version of the Athanasian Creed to prove the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father alone. It's so ironic that they're using the Athanasian Creed, which they believe is by St. Athanasius, to prove that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, which is absurd. Also recall that Ed Sachensky, in his book On the Filioque, asserts, By the late 6th century, the Filioque achieved a level of acceptance in the West, bordering on unanimity. In short, we have proved that the West universally taught the Filioque for centuries prior to the schism, and that saints venerated both East and West taught the Filioque. The Eastern Orthodox position on the Filioque leads one to assert half the Church defected from the true faith for centuries while they remain in communion with said heretics. Furthermore, the Eastern Orthodox position on the filioque commits one to saying that their own saints had a universal consensus on what they claim is heresy. This is an absurd position and proves the Catholic faith is right on the filioque, and therefore the Catholic Church alone possesses the fullness of truth. Now let's move on to some of the Western saints who teach the filioque. I will be reusing some material from my previous videos, but I'll also be adding new saints as well. St. Gregory of Tours is a saint both East and West living from 538 to 594 AD. In the history of the Franks, he says, quote, I believe in one almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three persons, one substance, the Father unbegotten, the Son begotten, the Holy Spirit neither begotten nor unbegotten, but co-eternal, proceeding from the Father and the Son, end quote. Once again, he's enumerating the hypostatic properties of the persons and says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both hypostatically. This East Orthodox cannot affirm. Also notice he's using language that's very similar to the Athanasian Creed. 
showing that this is a teaching of the Western Church. From Edward Pousset's book On the Clause, page 29, and from Wikipedia. Saint Avidus of Vienne is a saint both east and west, living from 450 to approximately 518 AD. He says, quote, We, for our part, affirm that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. It is the property of the Holy Spirit to proceed from the Father and the Son. End quote. You can't escape this. The hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Not an energetic property, not an economic procession. Hypostatic property. From Eric Yabarro's blog and from Wikipedia. St. Ildefonsus of Toledo is a saint both east and west, living from 607 to 667 AD. In De Cognition Baptisma, he says, quote, But the Father is from none, but of himself, and he is only the Father. The Son is born of the Father, co-eternal with the Father, and he is only the Son. The Holy Spirit proceeds inseparably from the Father and the Son, and there is only the Holy Spirit. End quote. Once again, the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from Father and Son. Not about energies, not about economy. From Wikisource. St. Fulgentius is a saint both east and west. He was an abbot and bishop. He states, quote, It is a property of the Father alone that he was not born but begot. It is a property of the Son that he did not beget but was born. It is the property of the Holy Spirit that he neither begot nor was born but proceeded from the begetter and the begotten. End quote. The Holy Spirit's hypostatic property is that he proceeds from the begetter and the begotten. That means he proceeds from the Father and the Son, as the Father begets and the Son is begotten. From Edward Sachensky's book, The Filioque History of a Doctrinal Controversy, page 67, and from Wikipedia. St. Eucarius of Lyon is a saint both east and west. He lived from 380 to 449 AD. He was Archbishop of Lyon. He says, quote, The Father is unbegotten, the Son begotten, the Holy Spirit neither begotten nor unbegotten, lest if we should say unbegotten, we should seem to speak of two fathers, or if begotten of two sons, but rather who proceedeth from the Father and the Son as a sort of concord of the Father and the Son, end quote. The Holy Spirit proceeds from both Father and Son, and he's a concord of both because he's their mutual love, showing that St. Eucharist of Lyon is a filioquist. From Edward Pousset's book, On the Clause, page 26, and from Wikipedia. St. Ephraim the Syrian is a saint both east and west. He's known as the Harp of the Holy Spirit. He was a deacon, confessor, and doctor of the church, and he lived from 306 to 373 AD. In one of his works, he writes, quote, The Father is the begetter, the Son the begotten from the bosom of the Father, the Holy Spirit, he that proceedeth from the Father and the Son. End quote. The Holy Spirit's hypostatic property is that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Here we have a Syriac father in the 300s affirming the Filioque. St. Leo the Great is a saint both east and west and doctor of the church. He lived from 400 to 461 AD. In Sermon 75, 3, he states, quote, And while in the property of each person, the Father is one, the Son is another, and the Holy Ghost is another, yet the Godhead is not distinct and different. For while the Son is the only begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son, not in the way that every creature is a creature of the Father and the Son, but as living and having power with both, and eternally subsisting of that which is the Father and the Son, end quote. So he's talking about the hypostatic properties of the person and how they're distinct. Then he says that the Son is the only begotten of the Father and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Well, why is that? Because he subsists of that which is the Father and the Son. In other words, he's a filioquist. Remember the Council of Blacrenae says that the Holy Spirit cannot be said to subsist of the Father and the Son. St. Leo the Great says otherwise. St. Leo the Great in letter 15 asserts, quote, and so under the first head is shown that unholy views they hold about the divine trinity. They affirm that the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is one and the same, as if the same God were named now Father, now Son, and now Holy Ghost, and as if he who begot were not one, and he who was begotten another, and he who proceeded from both yet another. But an undivided unity must be understood, spoken of under three names, indeed, but not consisting of three persons, end quote. So here we have St. Leo the Great fighting modalist heretics who believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all the same person. He says the correct doctrine is that the Father is the one who begets, the Son is the one who's begotten, and the Holy Spirit is the one who proceeds from both. Hypostatically, St. Leo the Great is a filioquist from New Advent. The local council of Hatfield was a council held in 680 AD. The following was said at the council, quote, 
glorifying God the Father, who is without beginning, and his only begotten Son, begotten of the Father before the worlds, and the Holy Ghost, proceeding ineffably from the Father and the Son, even as those holy apostles, prophets, and doctors whom we have above mentioned did declare, and all we who with Archbishop Theodore have thus set forth the Catholic faith there to subscribe. End quote. From Project Gutenberg, we see that the Council taught that the Holy Spirit has its origination from both Father and Son. This is clearly about hypostatic origination, as the Father being unbegotten and the Son being eternally begotten is talking about hypostatic origination. Furthermore, we see that these bishops affirm that the teachings of the previous ecumenical councils and the teachings of the Church Fathers is in line with the Filioque. And we know that this council is being held underneath St. Theodore of Tarsus, a saint both east and west, showing that he believes in the Filioque. This is found in St. Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People, chapter 17. St. Bede also states that St. Theodore's Confession fights the heresy of Eutyches, and how St. Theodore, quote, convene an assembly of venerable bishops and many learned men, end quote. Furthermore, note how in chapter 18, the venerable Bede states, quote, the synod we have spoken of, having been called for the purpose in Britain, the Catholic faith was found untainted in all, and a report of the proceedings of the same was given him to carry to Rome, end quote. So clearly, Venerable Bede is agreeing with the council and therefore is a filioquist and thinks that this is the faith of the fathers. Furthermore, he says, quote, Yet the testimony of the Catholic faith of the English nation was carried to Rome and received with great joy by the apostolic pope and all those that heard or read it, end quote. So Pope St. Agatha received this, meaning he's a filioquist as well, and he thinks this is the faith of the fathers. Furthermore, in that same chapter, St. Bede calls Pope St. Agatha the successor of the most blessed chief of the apostles. Here we have a local council with St. Theodore of Tarsus and St. Venerable Bede asserting that this is a Catholic faith, and here we have Pope St. Agatho receiving the Filioque Creed. This clearly shows that the Western Church universally taught the Filioque. St. Faustus of Res is a saint both east and west, living from 400 to 490 AD. In the Holy Spirit, chapter 13, he asserts, quote, If you want to know the difference between the one who is born and the one who proceeds, it is naturally because the former is the only begotten son of the father, whereas the latter has its origin from the father and the son, end quote. So the distinction between the son and the Holy Spirit is that the son proceeds from the father alone, whereas the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son, filioque. From Eric Yabar's book, The Filioque, Revisiting the Doctrinal Debate Between Catholics and Orthodox, page 141. Everyone should read that book. St. Paulinus of Nola is a saint both east and west, living from 354 to 431 A.D., in Poem 27, he states, quote, The Holy Spirit proceeds from the only begotten Son and the Father, and is himself God coming forth from God. End quote. God coming forth from God is indicating hypostatic origin. Proceeding from the Father and the Son means St. Polinus of Nola is a filioquist. From the Poems of St. Polinus, published by Newman Press, page 273. St. Boethius is a saint according to the Eastern Orthodox Church and is venerated in some dioceses in the Western Church. He lived from 480 to 524 A.D. In De Trinitate, chapter 5, he writes, quote, Thus, if Father and Son are predicated in relation, and they differ in no respect but this relation alone, the production of the Son is by that which is indeed substantial to the Father, yet the predicate Father is a relative one. Let us thus consider that God the Son certainly proceeds from God the Father, and that God the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. But since the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, Yet God has no differences by which he differs from God. It results that God differs from none of them. End quote. So here we have Saint Boethius saying that the distinctions of persons is by relation alone. And because of this, the Son is different from the Father because he proceeds from the Father, and the Holy Spirit is different from the Father and the Son because he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Filioque. There has to be relative opposition between the Son and the Holy Spirit. But for there to be relative opposition, either the Son produces the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit produces the Son. But the Holy Spirit does not produce the Son, therefore the Son produces the Holy Spirit, filioque. And clearly this is about hypostatic origin, not about energetic procession or economic procession, because he says, since the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. This is talking about the communication of the divine essence, or why they're God. And it's talking about the relations of origin, the hypostatic level, not about the energetic level. From Logic Museum's translation, and from Ed Stachensky's book, The Filioque, page 66. Pope St. Gregory the Great is a saint both east and west, living from 540 to 604 AD. In John's Gospel, homily 26, 2, he states, quote, Indeed, it is said of the Son that he is sent by the Father, in that he is begotten by the Father. 
our partridge in a ritter. But his, the Holy Spirit's, mission is a procession by virtue of which he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Therefore, just as it is said of the Spirit that he is sent insofar as he proceeds, so too the Son be said without being deceived that he is sent as he is begotten. End quote. The Son is sent by the Father because he is begotten by the Father. So the economic action of the Son being sent by the Father reveals his hypostatic origin from the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from both. Economically, reveals that he has hypostatic origin from both. That's the argument. He's a filioquist. You can't escape this. St. Isidore of Seville is a saint both east and west, and he's a doctor of the church, living from 560 to 636 AD. In the Etymologies of St. Isidore of Seville, page 158, we see the following is said, quote, In itself it is God. With regard to us, it is a gift. But the Holy Spirit is forever a gift, handing out the gifts of grace to individuals as it wishes. It imparts the gifts of prophecy to whomever it wishes, and it forgives sins for whomever it wishes for sins are not pardoned without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is appropriately named charity, either because by its nature it joins with those from whom it proceeds and shows itself to be one with them, or because it brings it about in us that we remain in God and he in us. End quote. Here we have St. Isidore of Seville, clearly showing that the Holy Spirit is forever a gift, and by its nature it joins with those from whom it proceeds, meaning the Holy Spirit is the bond between the Father and the Son and proceeds from the Father and the Son. Filioque. Saint Prosper of Aquitaine is a saint both east and west and disciple of Saint Augustine. He lived from 390 to 455 AD. In his book, The Book of Sentences of Saint Augustine, he compiles the work of Saint Augustine and he's quoting Tractate 99 where he asserts, quote, The Holy Spirit therefore always hears because he always knows and knows and hears that is to him that is always to be, but is always for him to be to proceed from the Father but no one can say that the Holy Spirit is not life, since the Father is life, the Son is life. And thus, just as the Father, since he has life in himself, gave also the Son to have life in himself, so he gave life to proceed from him, just as he proceeds from him. The Father gave the Son the procession of the life of the Holy Spirit, meaning he's a filioquist. And in fact, remember, this is about John 16, where the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. The Holy Spirit always hears because he always knows, and he always knows because he receives the essence from the Son. Clearly, St. Augustine and St. Prosper Racotain are filioquist. St. Augustine is a doctor of the Church, living from 354 to 430 AD. In answer to Max Ministerian, Book 2, Chapter 14, he says the following, You ask me, if the Son has the substance of the Father, and the Holy Spirit also has the substance of the Father, why is one a Son, and the other not a Son? Look, here's my answer whether you get it or not. The Son comes from the Father, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. The former is born, the latter proceeds. Hence the former is the Son of the Father, from whom he is born, but the latter is the Spirit of both, because he proceeds from both. When the Son spoke with the Spirit, he said, He proceeds from the Father, because the Father is the author of his procession. The Father begot a Son, and by begetting him, gave it to him that the Holy Spirit proceeds from him as well. If he did not proceed from him, he would not have said to his disciples, receive the Holy Spirit, and give the Spirit by breathing on them. He signified that the Holy Spirit also proceeds from him, and showed outwardly by blowing what he was giving inwardly by breathing. If he were born, he would be born not from the Father alone or from the Son alone, but from both of them. He would beyond any doubt be the Son of both of them, but be because he is in no sense the Son of both of them, it was necessary that he not be born from both. He is therefore the Spirit of both by proceeding from both. In speaking of that most excellent nature, who can explain the difference between being born and proceeding? Not everything that proceeds is born, though everything that is born proceeds. Just as not every biped is a human, though every human is a biped. These things I know, I do not know, I cannot, I am unable to distinguish that generation in this procession. The reason is that both of them are ineffable. The prophet says, speaking of the Son, who will tell of his generation? So too it is truly said of the Holy Spirit, who will tell of this procession. It is enough then for us that the Son does not come from himself, but from him from whom he is born. The Holy Spirit does not come from himself, but from him whom he proceeds, since he proceeds from both of them, as we have already shown. He is called the Spirit of the Father, where we read, If the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, and the Spirit of the Son, where we read, He who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. There are not two Holy Spirits, as if there were one for each, one of the Father, the other of the Son, but rather one of the Father and the Son.
End quote. So here we see St. Augustine is dealing with Maximinus, the Arian, who questions why the Holy Ghost is not a son. St. Augustine talks about the difference between generation and proceeding, and asserts that the Holy Ghost is not hypostatically generated by both, but rather he has hypostatic origin from both by procession. Therefore, he is not called a son. Hence, the procession from both is about hypostatic origin, as it is distinguished from hypostatic generation. This is why Photius, in Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, 68, affirms that St. Ambrose and St. Augustine taught the Filioque. St. Dionysius of Alexandria is a saint both east and west, living from 248 to 264 AD. St. Athanasius, in De Sententia Dionysi, quotes St. Dionysius and states the following, quote, I spoke of the Father, and before referring to the Son, I designated him too in the Father. I referred to the Son, and even if I did not also expressly mention the Father, certainly he was to be understood beforehand in the Son. I added the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, I further added both whence and through whom he proceeded, end quote. So here we have St. Dionysius of Alexandria, asserting that the names of the persons are relative. The Father is relative to the Son, and the Son is relative to the Father. And saying the name Father indicates the Son, and saying the name Son indicates the Father. But saying the name Holy Spirit indicates both, because he proceeds from both. As he says, I added the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, I further added both whence and through whom he proceeded, filioque. Clearly, this is about the relations of the persons and the relative names of the persons. So this is about the hypostatic procession of the persons. Hence, St. Dionysius is a filioquist. And St. Athanasius is quoting St. Dionysius of Alexandria, and he doesn't contest it. So St. Athanasius is also a filioquist. But we proved that in the previous video. And no, Craig Truglia did not disprove what I said in the previous video. In short, we have proved that the West universally taught the filioque for centuries prior to the schism, and that saints venerated both East and West taught the filioque. The Eastern Orthodox position on the filioque leads one to assert half the church defected from the true faith for centuries while they remained in communion with said heretics. Furthermore, the Eastern Orthodox position on the filioque commits one to saying that their own saints had a universal consensus on what they claim is heresy. This is an absurd position and proves the Catholic faith is right on the filioque, and therefore the Catholic Church alone possesses the fullness of truth. Remember St. Maximus the Confessor states, quote, Let him hasten to render in all things satisfaction to the see of Rome. When that see is satisfied, everybody will in common proclaim him pious and orthodox. The apostolic see, a.k.a. the see of Rome, which from God the incarnate word himself, as well as all the holy councils, according to the sacred canons and definitions, has received and possesses supreme power in all things and for all things over all the holy churches of God throughout the world, as well as power and authority of binding and loosing. For with this church, the word who commands the powers of heaven binds and loosens heaven. St. Maximus says that the see of Rome has from God the word himself and from the ecumenical councils supreme power in all things over all things over all the churches of the world and has power binding and loosing. Clearly the filioque was bound on earth and in heaven, and this also connects with the fact that the consensus of the saints taught the filioque, whereas the Eastern Orthodox, following the Council of Blackerne, cannot affirm this, showing Catholicism alone possesses the fullness of truth. From Craig Trulia's blog, from his book review of the Keys Over the Christian World. Remember, Vatican II in Lumen Gentium 14 states, Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. In other words, you have to become Catholic if you want to be saved. The ordinary means of salvation. Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We have clearly shown that the filioque is taught by saints both East and West, and that is the universal teaching of the Latin Church. The Eastern Orthodox position on the filioque is that it is a God-denying heresy, therefore showing their position on the filioque is false, and Catholicism alone possesses a fullness of truth. If there are any errors in this video, I submit to Holy Mother Church. If you are an Eastern Orthodox who is now having an existential crisis, pray the rosary. Our Lady is our most gracious advocate, and she will guide you to the truth. Thank you for watching this video, and let us close with a glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And if any of you were wondering, I am now back. I discern my way out of monastic life. I'm hoping once again to apply to religious life, probably a more active order in the future. But as of right now, I'm back living a regular life.